The final session, the big discussion, really is to answer the questions that many of you posed about the recruitment process. Um, this seems to be an area where people really do want good guidance, and I think our panel today are very well placed to give you that quality guidance that's so important in making successful applications. So I'm going to hand you straight over to our panel chair, who's Matthew Broadbent. He's the publisher of uh, Law Careers Net and Training Contract and Pupillage Handbook. So Matt, maybe you can introduce the rest of the panel for us. Yeah, Thank by you. all means. Thanks, Anna. Um, welcome to the big discussion, everybody. Um, so the, th the themes of this afternoon, I think, are, are going to be about the, the techniques, the nitty-gritty of the application process, how you can be um, effective and successful in that. And... I think the thing to perhaps be bearing in mind throughout is that there are a set of techniques, a set of rules, a set of, set of good practices that if you follow, um, you've got a very good chance of um, succeeding. Um, the nature of this process is you're looking for you know, virtual perfection in your applications. That in turn implies lots of planning. Um, so we're just going to try and look at, around some of the, 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 the sort of specific points that will help you in that process. So I've got with me an august panel. Um, uh, I think probably the best thing to do is, is, um, is let them introduce themselves. So, John first. Um, hi, my, my name's John Stevens. I'm currently a trainee at Ashurst. Um, just comes to the end of my first seat now, and that's been in real estate. Hello, my name is Gemma Baker. I'm the head of the career service at Kaplan Law School. I've been there for about two and a half years. And prior to that, I worked in graduate recruitment um, at two big city law firms for about nine years. Hi there, um, my name is Justine Thompson and I am the graduate recruitment manager at Baker & McKenzie. Um, I've been at Baker's for about six years now. Um, I've been working in graduate recruitment for 12 years, um, including a stint at Clifford Chance. Um, in graduate recruitment circles, I'm turning into a bit of an old timer, um, <laughs> but there you have it. <laughs> um, I'm Amy Elderfield. I run Apply for Law, which is um, an application system which you'll become really familiar with um, as you apply for training contracts and vacation schemes. Um, I've been doing the job for about six years now, and I get a lot of applications passing my desk in one way or another. So hopefully I'll be able to give you some top tips about um, how best to apply and present yourself. Okay, so um, let's, let's move straight into the meat of this. I'm, I was, sorry, there was one thing I was going to mention, as well as um, all these techniques, etc. we're going to talk about, we're also going to uh, hear a bit from John um, about the actual uh, experience of being a real-life person who's gone from um, being an applicant to being an attendee on a vacation scheme uh, at, to somebody who has successfully got into a firm. So uh, we'll get, perhaps get that sort of a bit later on. But the first thing we're going to look at... Um, is how many applications should you make? It's a much vexed question. I think we'll bring out lots of points about um, how much you can actually manage and the, uh, the, the nature of what the set, what, 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 what the level of quality required is. So maybe first person we can hear from is John. He can tell us, as a successful applicant, how many applications he made. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a good question, but I, I don't think it's the right question. I, I think... I think it's important to, um, it's not about the number in effect, um, it's, it's about the quality of the application. Um, I, I can't remember how many I made, but it wasn't as many as you might think. Um, I think the most important thing for me was to uh, take a, a certain amount of time, which invariably ended up to be about three days per application, um, just ensuring that. Um, all the I's were dotted, um, the commas were in the right places, um, sentences all made sense, just making, ensuring that the applications I did send to those firms <coughs> were um, the best applications I could produce. I would agree. What you often hear and, um, from speaking to students and also on certain online forums that people say, oh, I sent off 40 applications and I, I got rejections from every one and my, my answer to that really is I'm, I'm not surprised there's there's no way you can make 40 applications in a few months and have <coughs> even one of them be of any good quality especially when you've got to think about the amount of time it takes to research each firm and to make each application stand out as a an almost a semi love letter to that firm you know which really does show um, an absolute unbridled enthusiasm as why you want to base 
um, hopefully a very long career at, at that particular firm. And the more you make, the less likely it is that you've achieved that objective, really. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree. What we recommend is that you draw up a short list, and I guess um, the clue is in the word short, um, <coughs> short list. Um, and we really encourage um, students who are applying, whether it's for VAC schemes or for training contracts, to firstly think about what is genuinely important to you mm -hmm. from your career and to plug one of Matt's publications. You know, publications like the Training Contract and Pupilish Handbook are great because they give you a lot of information at your fingertips around, you know, the size of the firm, areas of practice, other people's experiences. Um, and you can use those resources to help to draw up a short list. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we discussed this beforehand and, and the, the view between all of us consistently was it's quality over quantity um, and if you want to get noticed and you, you want your forms to stand out for the right reason you do need to invest time in that um, and if you're studying you also need to make sure you don't let your studies slip mm -hmm. and so you have to find a balance um, and that means that it isn't possible as Gemma said um, to apply to 40 plus firms. Um, so, you know, just be, be realistic, um, fill out quality forms and um, not to give you a number, but somewhere between five and ten, I think is quite normal. One of the things I'm really aware that people seem to do a lot is um, produce Word documents, perhaps of standard answers that they might um, pop and use the information for those standard answers into an application form. Now, first up, the biggest mistake you're going to make there is probably dropping in the wrong firm name. But secondly, if you feel you can generate a standard answer to a question on an application form, then you're probably missing the point. Um, if you haven't looked at the website and you haven't tailored your response and you don't know why you want to be there, mm -hmm. then maybe you need to be going back to the first principle of doing a bit more research mm -hmm. before rushing in with lots more. I, mean, I think in, in our first panel today, when um, the question was asked of the panellists, what attracted to you to your first firm that you, you were a trainee or an article clerk at? Um, and they all made mention of something about the, the feeling of the firm, the vibe of the firm, the character of the firm. So perhaps we could examine what are some of the, what are the, some of the things that, ways in which you can read between the lines to actually understand... Um, how a firm func functions, why it ticks. What are the what are those research aspects that you need to look into? Because rest assured, quoting people's recruitment literature back at them is not enough. <laughs> Gemma, maybe you want to start on that one. Um, I, I think there's a few givens. You have to be driven. You know, um, most of the city law firms have got a starting salary of forty. Um, 40 plus thousand pounds a year and you're being paid that to work really really hard and, and to be a great ambassador for the firm so that kind of drive and motivation and um, that, you, that you're a high achiever is, is kind of par for the course but in terms of researching whether you're right for the firm just look at that li look at the literature look at their website see what kind of message they're giving out and um, there's some firms that say that we're rather more human and they consistently talk about that perhaps and they talk about their pro bono and other people would be talking about um, playing in the big leagues, big hitting clients. You've, you've got to really look at how they're promoting themselves and think, well, would I fit in here? Is this what I want to do? And there's so many ways you can meet firms nowadays. I mean, law is one of the professions at a graduate level where there are myriad opportunities and things like this to your law fairs, to open days, open evenings. And you can meet the people and really get a feel for the firm from those people. Because after all, they are the lifeblood of the firm. And they do represent the firm and its ethos. So, Justin, how, how, you know, what, what sort of period of time do you think it would take for somebody to really get under the skin of Baker and McKenzie and work out how the firm ticks? Um, well, I think it would depend on how they're getting under the skin of Baker and McKenzie. <laughs> I, think, I think that um, the reality is meeting people gives you a completely different perspective. And it is important to read the brochures, you know, to, to read the literature that's out there. Um, but ultimately, um, it doesn't give you that first-hand insight into a culture of a firm. And um, I don't know what John feels about this, but I think it's only really when you get on the inside, you start your training contract, um, you can be out of your depth 
every single day. And that's when you realise how important the working environment is, how important being in a culture where you feel comfortable, um, where you feel you can thrive and be at your best, just how important that is. Um, and finding out what firms' cultures are like is very difficult to do if you're just doing reading. Mm. Getting out there like you guys have done today is fantastic and that's where you will really start to get a differentiator bef between firms. When I used to work for Clifford Chance, people would ask all the time, oh, you know, what differentiates you from the rest of the magic circle? And you'd say, the people. Um, and, you know, without having that opportunity to meet the people, you're not able to make that differentiation yourself. And so I think, um, you know, I'd hope if you were in a room of bakers, lawyers, you'd, um, you'd learn very quickly what, what we're about and what makes us different. Well, another bit of evidence that I think you can, you can use is actually the, the recruitment process and very much the recruitment, app, the, the application document. I mean, Amy, you've helped lots of firms design their applications. I have, yeah. Do you, what, what do you think, what, how, how do you think you can read in between the lines in an application form to to work out what a firm's trying to get at? I mean, I think it really depends on, on how much... Well, it depends on the firm and how much they want to try and relate to you in the application process, something of character. So, I mean, I've got a, num a number of firms who will ask questions like... Um, Oh, what animal would you be if you could be any animal? And I know as an applicant you're probably thinking, oh, God, please don't ask me that question. But it does tell you something about the way in which that firm wants to interview, interview you, which tells you something else about what sort of person they're looking for. They're looking for someone who, who's confident about talking about themselves, who can get out of the comfort zone. And I think you just want to be looking for those clues throughout the application form. Um, one of the things I was going to say, because obviously I'm not working within a firm, I think it's quite difficult for me to speak about how, it, you, know, how you get under the skin of it, but I certainly emerged from university into a, into a recession, as, as you all will, um, and I think my attitude was that, um, oh, well, just any job will do. And I know that's the temptation, and I hear it a lot from people who are applying using, this, using Apply for Law. Um, I have to say, my first job was working for Women's Weekly, and it, it definitely was the case that not every job will do, not every job is for you, and you shouldn't assume, start from the assumption that it is. Um, so I just think, you know, the really key thing is read the website. If someone's gone to the bother of producing a microsite, if they've gone to the bother of producing a brochure, they're trying to tell you things about themselves, and there are so many opportunities to find out more. If you don't, you're not, you're not going to have a successful application, no. because you're not going to demonstrate your personality um, in, in a way that, that matches their criteria. And, and also, I would add to this, only apply somewhere you actually want to join. Yeah. Um, from speaking to students at, at Kaplan and they say, well, I've been offered a vaccine at this place and I don't really want to do it. <laughs> and, and I, one, it makes me quite angry because there's so many other people who would cut off a finger practically to have a vacation scheme at that same firm. Mm. Only apply to firms that you're, you're truly keen on and you're passionate about. And you maybe want to spend at least the next, the first 10 years of your working life at and building a really good career. Otherwise, it's just a waste of everyone's time, including your own. And that is pretty important. So, John, what, you know, again, we're going to get to the, to the applied version here. What, yeah. what attracted you to your firm? Why, why, why did they get the nod over the other people? Classic interview question. Absolutely. Um, well, I was, so I, I actually decided relatively late on I wanted to go into law. So I am coming to the end of my final year at university and was starting to think, um, what am I going to do? And uh, I need a job, effectively. So it was, for me, it was a case of taking, sort of trying to take a step back and analysing the, the, the things I thought I was good at. Um, and that, that led me... Down, down a legal path, and so I, I did a bit of work experience. Um, I the first bit of work experience I did was at um, a local magistrate's court, which is very interesting, but made me decide that wasn't quite right for me. Um, and then <coughs> I uh, started law school and was lucky enough to get a vaca a Christmas vacation scheme at a firm. So I had that experience. It was one week. Um, it. I realised it wasn't quite the firm for me. There was, there was a few things. I mean, number one, its size wasn't quite right. 
Um, was it too big or too small? It was probably a little bit too small. Um, so I speak a couple of languages and um, I, I, I would say I've got a relatively international outlook on things and it just didn't quite fit that for me. So when it came to Ashurst, um, I, I effectively just leveraged my experiences um, to say, well, actually, I'm starting to get a feel for the things I, 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 I don't want, um, the, type of, the types of firms I don't want to work in and apply to. And having had those experiences, I think Ashurst being a, a larger firm with a more international outlook, um, a, um, a firm which goes to great pains to uh, describe its, its, its culture and its people as um, very friendly, very open, um, um, type the sort of people that want to have a laugh um, and cre to create an environment which is um, accordingly good to work in. Uh, Ashurst, with its size and its, its offices um, around the world, was, was perfect for me. So the, presumably were there, only, there were only sort of perhaps two or three other firms that ticked all those boxes, internationalist, super to suitable size, work hard, play hard. Yeah. Friendly. Yeah. I was, I, I, certainly on the surface, the firm, there's not many firms, uh, going back to what we were saying earlier about the way a firm attempts to portray itself in, its recruitment lit in the recruitment literature, um, I didn't come across many firms that did try to portray themselves in that way, and I, th I, I certainly think there was something to that when it came to Ashurst. Um, that I quickly realised I didn't want to be in a firm that was seen as too big, but I also didn't want to be in a firm that was um, too So it was, it, was, it was just, it jumped up as big, as ticking the boxes, and that's why you went for it. Yeah. Great, okay. Now, I'm not, I think maybe we, we turn now to a bit more of the sort of nitty-gritty, the minutiae of the, the application process. Well, as we all know, there are sort of two main ways that these happen now. We've got application forms and we've got uh, the old school CV and cover and letter. Well, surely that's much easier. I mean, you know, these, these application forms, they're awful. Why are we, why are we, why are we doing these? Is CV and cover and letter, surely, surely really that's what we should be doing. Do we agree with that? Um, so some firms do still... Um, have a more traditional route of CV and covering letter. Um, it must be easier, at least. Um, easier for candidates, but for firms who are making decisions between thousands of applicants, um, what an online application form allows firms to do is collect, um, collect the same type of data on each candidate so we can make decisions which are fair, mm -hmm. are consistent, which give every candidate the opportunity to present the same type of information and it puts everyone on a level, level playing field. So that's not to, um, to, to, to put a negative slant on any firm that doesn't have an online application process at all. Um, but um, we certainly feel that an online application process allows us to recruit more fairly, more consistently. Um, some firms like Bakers are still keeping a bit of a finger in the, the oldie, worldy, traditional um, methods um, because on our application form we do have a covering letter. Um, but, um, but, but I feel really strongly that if you're recruiting in, in, in high numbers and you get high numbers of applications, the fairest way to do that is through an online application system. Also, the benefit to candidates is it's easier to track your applications as well. And you will get a response. Yeah. Well, I, and how do we apply, yeah, no. I want to apply, apply play question time and slightly disagree, um, <laughs> if that's okay, about um, CVs and covering letters being easier for candidates. I think the perception is it's a whole heap easier for candidates because, of course, you just print it off and you send it. However, that's the truest way of making a really bad application um, because you've got so much rope to hang yourself with, uh, with a CV and covering letter. If you do not target that... You, you are making a terrible mistake. It's almost too easy and therefore really easy to get badly, badly wrong. And the reason why firms retain the covering letter is because if you can't put in data like why you're interested in being a lawyer, why you want to work for them, what makes you interesting, you're straight out the door. So beware the covering letter, beware the CV, and give it as much time and as much attention as an application form would be my tip. So, of course, one of the things that was coming out of this at the... Uh, application form is, is, is looking to mine into very specific skills because a firm will be looking for an array of skills and competencies that are desirable to them. So how might we approach 
um, those kinds of questions and what are the, 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 the sort of what's the good practice for making sure that you are approaching those correctly and giving them the kind of data you're after thereafter? Well, I think you should kind of print out the whole application form as a blank uh, document and um, look at all the questions on the application form. You should then have a, a pretty, I'd call it a base document or a CV, um, which really does highlight all of your achievements pretty much from the age of 15. Don't ignore school. Some people say, oh God, it was years ago. It's years ago away from me. It's not years ago away, for, for years away for most of you. It's five years. Um, that's quite recent, especially for me and Justine now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you should be looking at all of your achievements um, outside of pure study. So you're looking at all of your extracurriculars and all of that kind of thing, and you're identifying what you've done well at. And then, rather than repeating yourself in an application form, you should be looking at the question and think, well, which of my achievements best fit this question or this question? And once you've mapped it out, make sure that you've included all the key points you want to say about yourself. Make sure that you are selling yourself as a brand, as a product. And there shouldn't be anything... I was speaking to a chap a couple of years ago, and he said, oh, I've left a few key achievements out so I can discuss them at interview. I said, but you're not going to get to interview because you haven't told them. <laughs> They're not psychic, and you've got to really remember this. You've got to, and sometimes I think it's not very, very um, British, but you've got to really boast, and you've got to brag, and you've got to say, look at me, I've achieved all of this on my own. This is all entirely self-motivated. If you don't, the person next to you is going to, and they will get the job above you, and that's a really key thing to remember. You've, you've really got to highlight your achievements. And people say, oh, the questions didn't come up on the application form. The application forms are designed so you can highlight your achievements. It means you're not using them correctly. Um, so really consider what the questions are and how your achievements fit in around that. And in terms of um, competency-based questions, I don't know whether you guys have come across firms who um, ask for you to talk around specific examples of when you've been in a team or where you've done this or that on the application form. And um, every student I talk to dreads coming across applications that ask those questions. And I thought it might be useful just to say a little bit about why firms use competency-based questions on application forms and an interview. And something it's worth you bearing in mind is that vast research in recruitment circles shows that past behaviour is the best indicator of future behaviour. So if you can demonstrate in the past that you're an outstanding team player, that you've got great leadership skills, that you can organise yourself and you can prioritise, then you will bring those, those skills to Baker McKenzie or whichever firm you're applying to. So that's why firms will use competency-based questions, whether it's on the application form or whether it's an interview. And sometimes just knowing the rationale behind firms choosing those types of questions makes answering them slightly more comfortable. I can't tell you why firms would ask you what animal you'd be or you know what your favourite colour is and why. Um, but in terms of competency-based questions, there's, there's real strong, hard rationale behind using them. And it's actually recruitment best practice to use competency-based questioning at some point in, in the application or interview process. And can I... I think Anna's, oh, sure. oh, sorry. Anna's. Interested in something that you uh, mentioned, Gemma, um, about the maybe something you did at school, and you know when is it? When does it become stale? I mean, at what age are we talking about? Well, I, I I'd say if, if you, I'd say up until the age of about twenty. I, I actually, I think it's all relevant until you've started a, a proper <coughs> career. So I, I don't know. I'd say up until the age of about twenty-five, twenty-six, it's it's all relevant. And I'd say the reason it's relevant, I'd say at the age of about 15, or, or probably earlier, and, and I'm really sorry if I sound patronising, is that when you're about 15, you're starting to make decisions for yourself, and they're not parent-led, if you like. So everything from that point onwards is something you're actively choosing to do well in, and that's why it's important to the recruiters, because it's a real indication of what you want to take on board once you get a job. And it is so, it's so important to participate at university if you don't feel that you've, you've done much whilst you're at school. So it wouldn't look desperate if somebody who is, let's say, in their late 20s put something from school. I mean, is, is there well, a, a problem with it? It depends what it is. If they're saying, oh, it was a, 
award for effort in sixth form than, than maybe in their 28. I'd, I'd, I'd probably start basing my key achievements then around my, my first career. In all honesty, and, and, and unless you had really standout achievements from school, and I think that the reality is, you know, you can list achievements from from um, school, but as a as, as a recruiter, um, you know, my opinion is you also need to talk about what what you've been doing recently yeah. as well, and um, and and you can you can make a judgment on what you put on your application based on what's most relevant, what's most recent, and actually, if 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 um, an achievement that is most relevant is something you did at school, put it down. But actually, if, if, um, if a more relevant achievement is more recent, then maybe you can prioritise that. But you've got to think around relevance and what's, what's recent. And for us, if we had an application from someone who was, you know, head boy at school, did Young Enterprise and Duke of Edinburgh, but hadn't done anything at university, that would, would, um, yeah. would ring a few warning bells. Well, I think I think another thing to just to stress is that you actually need to be very um, <coughs> systematic about going through what you've done. If we say that your previous a a achievements and um, behaviours are, are are what sums you up as a person, you actually need to go through those and look at each specific one and say, "Am I actually de demonstrating some of these key skills?" And, and and do it as a as a as a as a achievement by achievement and pull out those skills, tick them off against the the kind of things that you're trying to demonstrate to the firms. People are very, very bad at overlooking great bits of CV goals just by either not thinking about them properly or, or just discounting them. You may have seen on Law Careers Net, we have a, a section where you have your own account called My LCN. Within that, we've got a thing called Myself, which actually invites you to fill in a pro forma and then give yourself a score for attention to detail, drive, communication, teamwork. To just, to, just to make you think about it in those sort of terms and work out if you actually have all the composite parts of the ideal candidate that you've tried, to, tried to, to create. And the point about doing that as soon as possible is if you have got bits missing, if, there are th if you're saying, I'm actually really weak on teamwork, I realise, you've still got time to do something about it. Go and do a big teamwork, teamwork activity and then you can put it in the CV. You, know, be aware, you should be aware of your strengths, you should be aware of your weaknesses. But most importantly, you should be aware, you, know, you should be able to anal analyse whether you do have strengths or weaknesses. If you're not analysing properly, you know, you're, you're not, again, not going to be able to sell it yourself properly. And the, the, the things that are important um, in terms of extracurriculars are your music, sports, drama, voluntary work, community work, pro bono work. Um, and part-time work yeah. as well, I would say, if, you, if you're not able to get involved in extracurricular stuff to the same extent because you're working part-time um, don't be afraid to mention that under the interests and activities section of the form there's a risk otherwise that could be overlooked as someone who worked part-time from a levels mm. onwards um, you know you're taking on responsibility you're showing teamwork leadership everything that we're looking for under that category so and hard work and independence yes yeah, absolutely just to pick up on that, um, I think one of the worst, consistently worst parts of the application forms that I see has to be the presentation of work experience. Um, I don't know if there's something about the way that people fill it in, but it often looks like people think it should be a list. So they write where they've worked, and then sometimes, if you're lucky, they might write a few things like stocked shelves, worked on till. Um, very, very, very dull to read, um, and it doesn't really tell the recruiter anything. Mm. Um, why not talk about, you know, what that really brought to you? Why, why are you interesting as a result of having done that? Uh, and I think that will make your application much, much stronger. Um, there's almost zero point in putting a piece of work experience on if you don't sell it back to the person who's going to read it, as far as I, I'm concerned. Put it into context. If you worked Quite. in a firm, you know, member graduate recruiters aren't going to ha have heard of every firm, every legal firm in, in, yes. in the world. Um, and you've really got to say, you know, what, if you worked in a, you know, say what type of firm it was. For instance, you know, two weeks work experience in a busy high street practice specialising in family law. I worked primarily with a partner on blah de blah matters. And um, what I gave from this experience was, and talk about, you know, your overview of the legal profession. Did you learn about client care? Did you learn about negotiation? What did you, you know, did you learn about how to analyse, how to summarise, how to write a report? What was important here? Don't just wrote, I um, 
I did some filing. In fact, don't say did, use another verb. I did some research and I went to court. It's boring and it makes you look a bit boring, like you haven't learned anything from the experience. Yeah, lear learned is the crucial word. What firms are looking for is a record of increasing learning and achievement and an upward slope of, of what you've done and how you've developed. So everything you've done should be matched up with a, from doing this, I learned that. And then you can then you can demonstrate that progression. Otherwise, they're just they're just factoids in a void, which is no use. I think a really top tip on this is if when you read your application back to yourself and you think you were talking to any one of us, you would actively read what you've written on that piece of paper to us and think, "Wow, you're going to be really interested in me, and we're going to want to carry on talking." <laughs> then maybe that's good. If, however, you think this is not a conversation I can have, then don't put it in because it's l unlikely to be interesting to read. Uh, and keep a little notebook on your work experience. Mm. Make little notes every day about what you did, because you will forget. You know, mm. six months later, you're not going to be able to recall exactly what you did and what you felt you gained from it at that point. Have a little diary of just for applications, and so you can make notes to yourself and draw back on it um, at a later stage. It, it really is important. OK. Um, have you had any... I think there was something about tra fina trainee finance that I saw. I don't know. Can we have the Twitter call up? What have we got? Oh, well, they like the advice. That's good. Um, Lewis Silken Workshop. Maybe if you've got some questions, I, I don't know if yeah, you want to um, take a question now. Okay. We can go back to the agenda after that. Yeah. Yeah. For um, many applications for training contracts, um, they can open quite early and then the deadline is quite late, so you can sometimes have a period of six months to apply. Um, it's very hard to know when is the best sort of period to apply to them, not being too late, where plenty of other people have already been considered for a training contract. Especially if within that six months you've got some work experience lined up that you haven't yet done or you don't know about vacation schemes, etc. So it's the big window for vacation scheme, I mean, training contracts is quite confusing for students, I think. Okay, you've obviously been reading our agenda. Yeah. <laughs> One of the questions on here. Um, shall I, shall yep, I answer for, that? Yeah, um, There is a big window. I think um, it's, worth, it's worth speaking to the firms individually to find out whether they recruit on a rolling basis. Um, and that will give you a feel for whether um, you should be applying early or late. Um, a lot of firms, bakers included, um, will recruit around and post deadline. So actually, you're not at an advantage of applying six months before that deadline closes, whereas other firms do things differently. So I think the first answer to that is, um, is speak to the individual firms that you want to apply, those that you've shortlisted, and that will give you a sense. Um, in terms of the actual deadline date, um, a surprising number of people wait until the deadline um, uh, to, to send in their application. And to give you a stat, this year for our vacation scheme, over one third of all of our vacation scheme applicants applied on the 30th or the 31st of January. Um, you will still get considered. However, um, for most firms, we read every application from start to finish. The graduate recruitment team at Baker McKenzie is a small team of four, um, and towards deadline time, we wake up in the middle of the night dreaming of reading applications. Um, the reality is that if you do apply on the deadline date, that's when a, a very large volume of people will be applying. Um, and because of that, the turnaround time on your application may be longer. Um, so do bear that in mind. And if in doubt, speak to the graduate recruiters, have a look on the website, and that should give you an indication of whether you'd be at an advantage of applying earlier. Um, but for your own sanity, as well as anything else, don't leave it until the actual deadline date. Um, I mean, I agree with everything you've said, absolutely. Um, I, I, from my time as a graduate recruiter... I do remember getting, especially at the July deadline, you would get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, six, seven hundred applications in the last week. And the vast majority, in all honesty, 
aren't very good because they're so rushed. Mm -hmm. I think you should just pace yourself nicely throughout the year. I, I honestly would say about 90% of the applications received in the, in the final few days are just riddled with spelling and grammatical mistakes and really ill thought out. Um, so and it's almost not worth, worth your while applying. It's, it's better to not send in an application than send in one that's, that's completely half-hearted and, and just riddled with errors. Um, you know, you're not going to get through, so what's the point in sending it? Yeah, I mean, I think this goes back, this, this almost uh, makes, should make you think of a, a little, perhaps, checklist that you should um, have set up when you're making an application. First of all, you should have planned when you're going to start it, when you're going to finish it. Once you think you've finished the application, you should leave it, sleep on it, read it again, you will spot loads of mistakes, you'll find sentences that don't make any sense. Then when you've um, altered those, you should give it to somebody else to read, get them to pick out things that don't make sense to them, because you know what you're talking about, but somebody else reading it might not. Then you should check it again. If you finish the application, last question, and hit send straight away, it will be a bad application almost certainly. It really needs to mull and mature and be properly reconsidered. Like any piece of work, any piece of work that's just dashed off and sent out, it's probably not going to be of the highest standard. But that again goes back to the timing issue. Make sure you give yourself enough time to do this properly. And if you're doing it in the last few days, you'll get tired recruiters trying to plough through lots of applications and you'll be in amongst low quality applications. Yours will probably be one as well. So maybe almost say to every deadline, the real deadlines that we, uh, at least a week beforehand. Um, can I just say just one thing? Um, just really pay attention to the spelling of the firm you're applying to. Um, I know you're all thinking, oh, I'd never get the name of the firm wrong. Um, you probably have already. And um, for instance, when I was at Mayor Brown, I generally around, I'd say, 30 to 40% of applications would get the name of the firm wrong because Mayor was spelt with an ER, not an OR like Lord Mayor. And, um, and if, if you get some firms that are spelt with an and, or an ampersand, you know, a squiggle, that's the name you spell the firm. So Slaughter and May, for instance, you don't spell with an ampersand, and if you did, they reject the application. You're getting the name of the firm mm -hmm. wrong. It's, it's that picky. It's a, you know, they're registered. That is the name of the firm. One of my friends at another graduate recruitment, she um, counted up 19 different ways that people had spelt the firm over 900 applications. Um, so it's, it's a really, really easy thing to do because when you, when you do proofread, you skip over the words you think you know. And when I've, you know, people used to phone me up for feedback and I used to, I used to say you spelt the name of the firm when they stole, but that didn't come up on my spell check. Like, like that's an excuse. Mm. It, it's not. You know, you are your spell check. You cannot rely on a, on a, on a computer program to, to make your work perfect. To, to return a bit to the deadline issue, um, what happens if you, if you do do something, you've made an application, and then you've done something really great and you want to tell the recruitment team about it? Um, if you're using Apply for Law, there's a little tool that once you've submitted, it's called Supplementary Information. You can add information to an application form once you've submitted it, and the graduate recruiter will see it. So I don't think use that as the reason. Don't, don't use having more experience by the time of the deadline as the reason not to submit. Um, and I think you know, there's a great deal of difference between a last-minute application um, that, that has been considered over many weeks and one that's rushed. Um, and one of, the words, one of the biggest parts of my year is spending the days after deadlines dealing with candidates who have, for one reason or another, either missed a deadline or made such a hugely embarrassing mistake on their application form that they're not going to be considered. And I have to say, because the amount of time that application forms are open for, we find that our clients aren't really very um, sensitive to your need for that application form to be reopened or for a deadline to be um, to be extended. In fact, it's very, very, very rare that that does happen. So just bear in mind that when you press that submit, submit button, you're really, you're really submitting something that should be final and should be really great, um, I would say. And again, back Or to we'll speak on the 1st of August. Back, back, <laughs> back, to, back to the point we made, I made right at the beginning. Make it, an application needs to be perfect. Well, actually, so does the contract that you're working on when you become a lawyer. Actually, having, showing good technique in filling an application form Checking, rechecking, re eliminating errors shows that you have got some of the skills of becoming a lawyer. So, you know, it's ju just the very nature of making an application 
is part of the is part of the job description. Um, we've got about ten minutes left. Um, just, I'd like to remind you again. Please, could you fill out your um, forms before you leave, your feedback forms, and fill out the questions, just so that we don't have a mad rush and miss half of them. So, if we can just be keeping an eye on that as we're going. Um, have we got any other points? Should we have a question? Yeah. Um, well, one of the questions that we often get asked, uh, well, always, always get asked when we go out on campus, and it hasn't been asked here yet. Um, so I thought maybe I'll ask it for you, um, is how to make your application stand out. Would it be useful for us to talk through um, what makes applicants stand out on paper? Yeah? Okay. Shall I start? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it's, a, it's such a difficult question, and one person did actually ask me this earlier during the networking. Um, it is hard to make yourself stand out on paper, but having said that, in a really competitive recruitment process, it's pretty important to make yourself stand out on paper if you want to get invited through for interview. Um, how to make yourself stand out? In reality, for most firms these days, your academic record on its own is not enough, sadly, to make an application stand out. Even if you're a straight A or A star applicant um, with a first class degree, if that's all you've got going for you, it's not enough to make you stand out. Um, what firms typically are looking for is people who are really well rounded, so, you know, who fulfill the work experience expectations, who have got a great range of extracurricular involvement. But, what really genuinely makes applicants stand out, in my mind, as a recruiter who I'd say over the years I've probably reviewed over 15,000 applications, is how well written and how passionate an applicant is. Um, every element of your form should be well written and, um, and actually it's quite sad um, that um, well written applications do genuinely stand out and hopefully that shows that um, quite a number of applicants that we hear from don't write their applications well. Every part of your application should be structured. It should have a start, a middle and an end. It should flow well. Mm. If, if you're writing a covering letter or explaining why you want to work for a particular firm, that should be really genuine. It shouldn't be a regurgitation of stuff from the website. It should explain what you want from your career and how the firm you're applying to can fulfil that, can, can fulfil your career aspirations. And I think that what so many students these days do is tell firms what they think that firm wants to hear. But in the reality, you should be talking around what you want from your career and why the firm lives up to that. And that is what will make you passionate, genuine, and your application is far more likely to flow if you approach it from, from, from that basis. And um, I don't know whether anyone else wants to add yep. to that. Well, I think that's, we've got a couple of hands up. So, did you want the striker shirt? Were you want, you were... Let's whip through a couple more points. Now we've got a chance. Hello. Um, with applications that I've seen, certainly for vacation schemes, normally per question it says maximum 250 words or whatever they're asking. What is really the scope for this? Because I don't know whether to like pad out my answer so it reaches that maximum <laughs> um, or just right? Um, well, I think if it's 250 words about why you want to join the firm, mm -hmm. it, in all honesty, when you get to interview, and that will, it will be a question, you need to be able to talk about that for a good five minutes. If you can't find 250 words as to why you want to join that firm, you, probably you should be to. probably applying <laughs> to them. And that's the honest answer. Um, and what I would say is often use the word count as a guide around how much information a firm is expecting. Yeah. Um, because the word count is not only a limit so that we're not reading, you know, 100 page long documents, but it's also a guide as to the level of information you should provide as well. I'm it's not also giving away any industry secrets when I say that a number of our clients have will see or ask to see how many words as for word count a candidate has used. Uh, this gives them an indication of, you know, how well the candidates read the question. Uh, I think similarly, we did have one client that used to have a, a question on the application form, was what three words would you use to describe yourself? 
and anybody who used any more than three uh, instantly got a black mark. So <laughs> I think, you know, it, it, there is an element of using your judgment. Don't be tempted to pad. If, if you haven't got anything more to say, then question, should I have something more to say? And if the answer is no, then don't start writing airy-fairy stuff. And, and the short word counts also a really great test of your um, written, a, written ability, which is absolutely yeah. paramount. Again, a, a lawyer skill. Another question here. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in, in terms of the selection process, what would be the first uh, thing that you would, um, what uh, first criteria would you use to sort out the applicants? Like, for, for, um, for example, would you take the grades as being the most pertinent uh, thing to consider? Would you just instantly look at the grades, and if someone has two twos in their first year, for example, would you Im immediately say, oh, no, we're not going to accept this person? Um, well, how how the, important are grades? The, the grades, with, with grades, you either meet a firm's academic requirements or you don't. And, um, and if you don't meet the requirements, you know, we'll certainly still read the rest of the form, um, but, it, but it's very unlikely, unless you've got extenuating circumstances, that you'll be considered. Everything else, you know, there's, there's not one element of a form that's weighted ahead of other elements of the form. We look for you to perform to a very high standard right the way across. You should be well motivated. You should have tailored your application to the firm. You need to have good team and leadership skills. You should have work experience. It's all important. OK, we're nearly out of time. Um, one more question. I hope it's going to be, how do I prepare for meeting a firm with you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, perhaps that does come into it a bit. I was wondering if we could talk about interviews and the critical mistakes that people tend to make and what the applicants that you're most impressed by tend to do in their interviews. Um, well, I think well, there's a, it would take a whole hour, to be fair, but one is to, to turn up on time, and I'm really serious about that. A staggering proportion of candidates are five, ten minutes late and think it's OK. It's not. Um, and really, you've, you've got to come prepared for, for a, a hard day and for a bit of a grilling. You've, um, you need to know about the firm and you need to understand the firm, what its position in the market is, what it's good at, who, it, who are its competitors. Also, really crucially, you need to understand what a solicitor does and what their purpose is in a firm. What do they do? Well, what do, do they do? They, they make profit for the firm by providing ex an exemplary client service within a legal framework. Um, and I think that you, you've really got to show a passion for the law. So when you ask a question like, why law? And you say, oh, I want to work in a, um, somewhere that has great career structure, where it's client orientated and um, it's, it's based around teamwork, I could honestly say, well, that's my job. Why law? You've got to make it specific. You're talking about working in a really commercial environment, working with clients to achieve their goals. And you've really got to focus in, in on what that, are, that does. And you've got to understand the firm you're applying to and understand what they do and, crucially, what they don't do. And I think... Um, I, I, Sorry, I think, this, I think this is such an important point. Don't underestimate how much impact your first impression can yeah. make. Um, because, you know, a lot of candidates we see at interview, you know, look like a rabbit caught in the headlights, um, which is such a nerve-wracking process, particularly if you're being interviewed by partners. But remember, partners are genuinely, you know, they're real people, they're normal people. And if, if you... Um, approach the interview looking frightened, um, you know, feeling incredibly nervous. It's going to be very difficult to make a good first impression and very, very difficult for you to build a rapport with your interviewer, which is absolutely fundamental if, if, if you're going to get made an offer. Um, so when you meet your interviewers, smile, really good, firm, solid handshake and try to enjoy the process because not only will you get more out of it, but secondly, and most importantly, you'll build a better rapport with your interviewers, and that is an absolute fundamental of any interview. Mm. Can I take you back one step? What I hear that people make the, most, the biggest mistake is being rude to the receptionist, being difficult in the organisation of the process, not being friendly with the person who takes you to reception in the lift. All of that stuff matters. Absolutely everyone who you talk to at that firm or who works with that firm is a spy. Remember uh, it. Right. And remember uh, to really present yourself at every opportunity. No, and this is key. Um, one of the firms I worked at, part of the, um, the assessment was that you had a guided tour by a trainee. And we had someone who had done very, very well 
in the partner interview and they've been shown around by a trainee and the candidate's phone rang. And you sound something like, well, you do forget to turn off your phone. It's a bit of a no-no, but anyway. But they answered it. But bear in mind, they were walking around the floor, the fee earners and everything, turned around to the trainee and said, do you mind? This is a personal call. <laughs> now, the trainee just kind of looked at them, nodded, stepped back, ran to our office, and they, that was it. Yeah. That, they were going to get offered. And, you, and this is someone who's got through the application stage, who's got to interview. This isn't someone who, who, who hasn't applied themselves. And that kind of thing, especially with trainees, happens the whole time. Don't let, you know, trainees are, are part of the assessment process. They are really proud of the firm. They made that much effort trying to get there. And they only want to be surrounded by really positive colleagues as well. So, so don't think you can say what you want or moan about some aspect um, um, of the firm that they didn't like, like um, the sandwiches okay. and that, that really silly things like that. Right, I think we'll have to wrap it up. I, I, my, my final little point on the interview, it's, it's preparation. And every time you meet someone from a law firm, you're being interviewed to some extent, so always be prepared. It's really simple. Thank you very much. Anna's just going to have to say a few final words. Thank you to all the panel.